I'm Eric Davis, and I had the great good fortune of spending a few days with Terrence McKenna and his girlfriend Christy Silnes in their jungle home on the island of Hawaii in November 1999. Sadly, the occasion was not so fortunate. McKenna had been diagnosed with a brain tumor the previous summer, and he was home recovering from a recent craniotomy. I was there to profile him for Wired magazine, and it turned out to be the final interview he gave before his death, the age of 53, in April 2000. McKenna's home lay along a rutted road that wound its way up the slopes of Mauna Loa from the South Kona coast. It was a white, modernist origami structure topped with a massive satellite dish and a small astronomy dome designed to house a telescope that McKenna could not yet afford. The house and gardens were surrounded by a riot of vegetation, but among the native flora lay thick ropes of Banisteriopsis coffee and a sprinkling of flowering Salvia divinorum. Every morning, I ascended a spiral staircase decorated with blue LEDs to get to the study, where McKenna spent the bulk of his time either working on his Macintosh or sitting cross-legged on the floor before a small oriental carpet surrounded by books, smoking paraphernalia, and twigs of sage he occasionally lit up and wafted through the air. His library was magnificent, thousands of books on alchemy, Tibetan art, Hindu metaphysics, systems theory, archaeology, astronomy, and, of course, psychoactive lore. During the day, I asked the usual reporters questions, but in the evening we would relax and follow less quotidian pathways through the cosmos of conversation. McKenna rose to the occasion of his own mortal condition, and though he tired quickly and occasionally spaced out, he was as brilliant and funny as ever. What follows are edited portions of these dialogues. So what was your, uh, what was your, uh, your first like encounter, like with psychedelics, either in a strong way or just, well, was a friend of a friend of mine when I graduated from high school and they were building that band. So he insisted that we eventually smoke pot and take acid and, uh, and I had never encountered old lefties or acid heads or musicians or people who gave a shit about any of this stuff before. It was all new to me. I had just come from Colorado to the West Coast, so I was easily swept into all of this. And, uh, yeah, he and his friends were into... Uh, who was that strange heroin-based comedian? Lenny Bruce. No, no, not Lenny Bruce. Stranger, more heroin-based. <laughs> the, the guy who did the thing about Dinez. Lord Buckley. Oh, okay. Yeah. They were into all of this stuff. And I had been studying the Evergreen Review for a couple of years trying to figure out what was going on with the culture. But when I finally got to the scene and all this acid and all this left-wing politics and all that, then I understood. And so anyway, so you got, so he turned, he turned, he basically turned me on and, uh, were you kind of fascinated from the get go? Well, I'd been worrying about mescaline since I'd read, doors of perception three or four years before and i'd also read um have lock alice's the dance of life which has a long chapter on mescaline actually that that passage in have lock alice it's only a page or so is one of the most uh, seducing passages in all of psychedelic literature they were, he was taking peyote at the turn of the century. These are the people who really got into the, under the wire. People who took it a hundred years ago. Can you imagine? That is hard to grab hold of. <laughs> <laughs> but you, were you always sort of partly as much influenced by uh, the kind of alchemical, mystical book, historical books you read? in some way as as well as like the more primal evolving well i was raised by catholic rationalists so you know it's hard to square that in other words 
you would run around spending part of your time trying to understand the nature of guardian angels and the rest of the time grappling with fairly rational concepts. I mean, my family's basic orientation was mining and not science in the sense of degreed science, but my father was an electrician, my uncles ran radio and television repair shops, and my father flew, navigated, did radio. So, uh, but I did spend a lot of time grappling with shit like the nature of the soul, the nature of sin, the, the, all of these imponderables, you know. And of course, what you end up doing is you end up reading scholars of mysticism. And then I would read about what John of the Cross or somebody else got hold of, and then I would try for it. And I don't recall getting too far, but... Uh, when you were still quite young. Right. Yeah. When you were still, you were still thinking in a Catholic mode. Yeah, because it was all religious mysticism. Right. There was no other form of mysticism before, I guess, before Huxley published his books. I mean, it was somehow, uh, well, for Catholics, there was no other form of mysticism. There was Ospenskyitis. Mm -hmm. and Gurdjieffianism and all these peculiar mm. but none of that was quite kosher was... <laughs> did you did you did you have a uh, a break with Catholicism or did it just mutate into all of your it sort of mutated I read Jung is what happened I read, I first read Psychology and Alchemy, and that led me on to um, the other one, which is deeper about all of that. It's something about the nature of the Christos and alchemy. And, and then I saw what the, how these geographically defined religious impulses could be part of some broader, deeper, thing and alchemy it was a revelation to me all that i didn't get religious history from the church the way i got it from jung because from jung i realized it was books and so you could read these books I mean, it was torment tortuous it was when i was first going to cal but on the other hand i had a library card and I could actually get at this stuff in whatever form it can never be gotten at. I mean, alchemy makes no sense at all if you actually read the literature. Right. So when you decided to start speaking or doing these conferences and speaking on the radio, did you have a sense of your of a kind of mission? Well, I always felt people should know about psychedelics, that that was the untold story, you know that if there was anything new to be said or brought into the cultural dialogue, it was the news that these psychedelics were not these very tricky to manufacture drugs like LSD, but that it was really about plants. And I don't know if I would say I had a sense of mission. I certainly thought it was a fine idea that people realize and I was also interested in feedback. You know, it wasn't that I wanted to enlighten people. I wanted to hear what people had to say about this stuff because to me it was all so confounding. The transformations of language, the what it did to information. I mean, that's still what psychedelics are about. It's what it does to information. You know, t talk about that a little bit. How, how do you... Well, it seems to show some kind of, uh, how would you put it, some kind of universality of source or some, some uh, language is not syntax, it's not grammar, it's none of these things. It's some kind of divine uh, 
you could almost call energy, which flows out of objects and situations. Everything wants to communicate. And so then what the chain of being is, is somehow handing connectivity on, you know, to the next plant, animal, human being, work of art, whatever it is. And uh, I'm, I still grapple with what all this means. And to me, it's the most psychedelic part of the psychedelic experience is when you get the, the logos coming out of the trees, the rocks, the berries, the water, everything. And it's the most Taoist part of it. It's where nature becomes transparent to its own intent to communicate or something like that. Do you, are you, uh, when you think back of what you felt like you were involved with in, you know, in the, in the mid seventies in terms of propagating the psychedelic experience, mm -hmm. and you sort of felt that this is, you know, in a way you were be, being one of a number of Johnny Appleseeds. Uh, um, when you look now at what happened, you know, or emerged from that, are you uh, disappointed in some ways? Or No, I don't think so. Considering the fact that uh, for the past year or so, or maybe longer, it's been legal to grow mushrooms in Holland and purvey them, I would say all the goals were met. The, the thing was brought into human cultivation. It'll never leave it. You know, it's... Uh, a very rare thing to be able to bring an organism into the human family like that. And when we found Strophaeria cumensis, it was standing waist deep in cow shit. And now it's part of the human family of agricultural production. It'll never leave it. It'll always be part of global culture now. So... And do you think that, do you have the feeling that in some sense it will remain, at least for the foreseeable future, a somewhat marginal uh, road, like a path that a certain, certain temperaments or uh, characters inside of the social matrix of, of reality have recourse to, but that n don't really dominate? Sure, because if they really wanted a lot of psilocybin, you would do it differently. You would grow it in enormous vats of liquid that were the size of railroad cars, and you would produce millions of hits within days of scaling up. So, uh, no, what it is is it's a, it's a folk technology at the margin of civilization and an underground technology for the production of... Uh, these drugs, like, I understand you can make methamphetamine out of Clorox and some other shit. I have no idea, but it sounds very similar, uh, in, very simple. Well, so this kind of, at the edge of things, knowledge is very uh, critical to, uh, and that's where the shamanism is in the culture. It's, you know, the tricks of the train. So uh, the shamanism enters because that's an inevitable... Well, these are esoteric secrets, how to make drugs. And the drugs are change minds and make money. So inevitably it's going to be part of where some kind of negotiation takes place. Negotiations like that rearrange the, the morphology of the social or the, well, the mind space of the people there. Well, what do you think constitutes a, a, a postmodern shaman, someone who's legitimately doing shamanic work and not sort of acting out of fantasy or playing some game of, a, of like a soci uh, identification with the other? Well, I think you have to be, you have to know your pharmacology and trust that you know it and then be trusted sufficiently that you're willing to lead people with confidence through these places. These ayahuasca psychiatrists are very 
courageous to and have built up sets of metaphors and assumptions that I think are probably true or true enough. Uh, but it, you really it takes balls to hold your ground with this stuff. You know? That must have been interesting. The sense that you were propagating the the philosopher's stone to the to, to the brethren. Oh, and it was going many other places. Yeah. There's a lot of people were No, that's what I meant. I mean, through, through the whole sort of network of free culture. Yeah. Well, and it wasn't so much the, the, the mushroom, it was the information, you know, the knowledge of the technique. It was like the atom bomb or something. It was not whether you had it or not. It was whether or not you knew how to do it. And so it's interesting to see the way that other plants now, I mean, if the if, uh, mushroom, the mushroom parasited on print pamphlet technology, now the uh, more emerging plants that are re-encountered have a different well, so propagation the, device of, of, meat, of information, if that's the forward. Yeah, in one case, uh, Braz Brazilian cults, in another case, almost landscaping like salvia. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that those clumps of salvia on the road, but all the blue flowers and all that. Uh, yeah, the the mushroom is the most uh, insidious and amusing because it seems to uh, f associate itself with human beings. Like, for instance, the, one of the densest psilocybin ecologies in the world is Oregon and Western Washington. Well, one of the main industries of those areas where these mushrooms are so dense is um, the production of sod to be shipped all over the country and world to, to, to be pushed into malls and hotel uh, lawns and golf courses to spread. So it's essentially an enormous economic engine for spreading psilocybin spores throughout the planet. What happens to people that lets them tune into a deeper level of intent that wakes them up from the spell of, of mere consumerism and the kind of subjectivity that is, you know, the manipulation of images and desires that constitutes consumerism and which dominates many people's lives. Well, then they probably head for, head for deeper values, either Buddhism, shamanism, their own, you know, whatever lies in their own ethnic uh, background. Because in fact, civilization is a carnival. I mean, it's a cheap, it's a, uh, it's a delusion of a solution. So anybody who sees past the front door probably wants really real structured values. And so that's where all the conservative resistance comes from. Fundamentalist Christians, Orthodox Jews, Buddhists, all of these people are saying, well, hey, wait a minute. We, we, we don't want to go down this path only so far. And that's probably a good break. Otherwise, we would create a civilization that was essentially a mall. And there's enough of that anyway. So in that sense, that, that turn towards deeper values, even if sometimes they take a conservative form, is ultimately a kind of healthy balance to just the sheer rush toward novelty. Yeah, yeah I think so. And do you see psychedelics playing a role in, in opening up that kind of? It depends on how it's presented. It depends on the psychedelic. Uh, the, if it comes along with some wizened 90-year-old Indian from South America, it's hard to see that we're abandoning ourselves to the the trivial and the concocted. Uh, and so 
it's a marketing and packaging issue, basically. In, in, so what would what would that look like then, if you, if if you were? Well, I'd say the wrongly packaged version would be some kind of like Castaneda's a formulaic cult. Do these things, take these drugs, follow these instructions, and moral obligation will flee from your can. Uh, nobody can be that foolish. You know. uh, if, on the other hand, you, you, know, you sincerely pursue this stuff, grow the plants, try to understand it, try to revivify the rituals and figure out what it's all about, well, that's an authentic push towards spirituality. And a very authentic push towards spirituality and probably fruitful. Do you think in that process, the, the actual handling of the plants, growing them, getting to know their cycles is uh, necessary? Yeah, because that's the level, that's the speed, that's the, well, that's the speed on which nature makes this stuff brings it to the surface and invites its contemplation. And it's also probably the right speed at which to assimilate the stuff, to come to terms with it. So in that sense, part of the problem with synthetic psychedelics is that they fit too easily into a kind of consumerist model. Lifestyle, right. That it's not a product, you know, it's not something you get the drug of the month or something. Um, although all these things have been proposed and some have been tried, uh, it seems to me the the shamanic drug of the month is not a very appealing idea. What are the um, uh, emotional, psychological, ethical expressions of really kind of genuinely long-term good psychedelic people? What is the long-term ethical expression of the good of psychedelic people yeah well it's some kind of it's some kind of effort to separate shit from shinola in other words it's uh, some kind of effort to uh, distill uh, a rash a, a truth from the blooming, buzzing confusion of the universe. So it's a branch of, I don't know what you would say, cognitive science or something like that. It's a, an effort to define the human essence away from its content or something like that. You see what I mean? Tell, explain a little more. Well, it's a, it's a branch of psychology. It's a self-study in psychology. So anybody who's taking psychedelics is, I assume, trying to present a truer image of themselves to other people and the world through this process of um, distillation of understanding. And that's where the connection to alchemy and all that comes in this distillation of essence away from the dross confusion and gnostic muck of the world is a kind of uh, like a union individuation process or something like that and that and that manifests in the, in the call even in normal life to present it yourself articulate yourself oneself differently i think so yeah, and causes people to be willing to take chances, uh, both pharmacological and sociological, by being involved in something so marginal. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the, in the big civilizations, this kind of shamanic stuff is definitely very marginal. Most people just don't do it. Do you feel that that characterizes the overall or in some significant way the kind of people that you've met for the last 
It depends on how often they do it. You know, some people are doing it because their friends are doing it. Some people are doing it because some, I don't know, they're <laughs> feeling some kind of social pressure. But the people who are really called to do it are rare. <clears throat> you know, the people who say, well, I get loaded 10 times a year on high-dose psychedelics or six times a year. That's a lot. I mean, that means yes. your lifestyle is pretty much defined by, by all that hmm. stuff. Yeah, I would love to know what the real numbers are. How many people a year get really loved it once you get the Amazon Indians out, you know, the Mexicans out, and a few of these people out. It's hard to even know how you begin to make an estimate. You know? did, um, be, before your sickness, did how often did you do lar large journeys? Mm, less and less often. I mean, I noticed that through the 90s. That, uh, but maybe four or five times a year get but I always felt never enough you know never enough so do you have the sense that when, that the tripping you on some level are getting uh, getting something done that the tripping something being, is getting something yes done? That, that there's something being worked out like continuously and progressively yeah, I assume that basically the download called history, meaning all the technology, social innovation, philosophy, art, fashion, architecture, is some kind of dialogue with this, well, higher mind, I'm not entirely comfortable with that, but this higher mind that keeps showing these different facets through the mist and I mean, that science and, and psychedelic and all this is a dialogue with the mathematical deep structure of nature. And that somehow as you get that out, there's this sense of progress, more than a sense of progress, progress. And I don't, and, uh, you know, in terms of what is it all leading toward or what it's about, it, it must be something about like the spiritualization of matter, that matter is evolving toward quintessence or essence or something like that. And, you know, we're the startled witnesses to this thing because we're part of this stuff that I called emergent properties or, you know, the the uh, side effects, you could almost say, of the universal emergence of matter into spirit. Because that's what biology is. I mean, I think biology is uh, the quantum mechanical uh, magnification of uncertainty into macrophysical space so that essentially we're chemical systems that by some means yet to be understood amplify quantum mechanical uncertainty into dimensions such as we see and that permits um, these emergent properties and systems and morphologies to, to show themselves and and that's the trick, or that's the trick explained on one level. You know, it's funny, in your raps, you, you stay away from uh, what to a lot of people would be would consider spirituality. In a, in a way, like uh, the way that somebody would present their, you know, Jewish spirituality or kind of Buddhist practice or whatever. You don't talk, in fact, often you sort of, like you've slagged the, the guru model and you kind of separate yourself from that. And you really have a kind of, like you've maintained the sort of, I don't know, I don't want to quite characterize it right now, but, um, and yet at, at points, obviously, you're, you are motivated by something that in your own language you might, you would call spiritual. 
Well, what what is what comes up around that word? I guess I believe I'm some form of progressive history, that history is progressing. So then the story of evolution and biology and human culture and all this is assumed to be a story with a happy ending. So in a way, this belief in telos which is not philosophically sanctioned or, or this eschatological vein in my personality is what gives it a spiritual impulse. But it's the idea that time, it's an alchemical idea, actually. It's the idea that time will perfect matter. And uh, I think it probably will perfect matter. What do you think about do you think that like postmodern spirituality is a sort of legitimate term or, or project? You mean to believe or involve yourself in, or believe? It's not really about belief. I I I mean that whatever the kind. I mean, there's a lot of people now who are developing a relationship with all different kinds of spiritual practice, and they're not really doing it even in the way that people did in the seventies where there was so many, so much more true believing. It's, it's a different kind of relationship. It's probably on a short spin, a short cycle that a lot of empiricists are taking up Dzogchen mm -hmm. and that how long can that go on? Uh, so then there'll be a lot of revisionism and rethinking and recasting of all this, which is the very best thing for it. Yes, it is. So were you ever very interested in the meditation or yoga? Uh, when I was in India and immediately before I went to India, when I was in the Seychelles the first time I, I was, because when I was in Mombasa, Kenya, I came upon this place called the, I can't remember, anyway, it was a library that was basically having a bargain sale in theosophical literature. So I took about 50 kilos of, uh, of uh, yogic uh, Arthur Avalon theosophical literature with me to the Seychelles. And that was what I read and worked through when I was out there. How is it that you relate to mysticism, to mystical experience? Oh, you mean as a source of valid data about what's going on not even that far i mean that's that's one way of saying of, of judging it in one way or another and it's, it doesn't necessarily be valid data it's just i mean you've been interested in this library obviously mysticism is completely surrounding us well i guess i would say the more personal the mystical indicator is probably the more likely i am to take it seriously in other words it seems to me if you extrapolate your mystical insight beyond the personal, you probably enter into the domain of inflation, of some, some kind of psychological inflation. And so was Plato inflated? Was Plato inflated? No, probably not, but he probably gets a pass as uh, some kind of... Uh, pie at me. <laughs> <laughs>